Hi, and welcome back. DaVinci Resolve 20, eh? I'm sure by now you've already downloaded the public beta and started playing around with some of the new features. However, in this episode, I want to concentrate on some of the editing features that I think are the most exciting, with a particular emphasis on the stuff that's available in the free version. To begin with, it's worth noting that although your existing Resolve 19 project libraries are compatible with Resolve 20, individual projects that are created or opened with 20 cannot then be reopened in 19. When you do open a project, Resolve 20 will inform you the project needs to be upgraded. Just to be on the safe side, you should always back up your projects in Resolve 19 before upgrading to Resolve 20, just in case there's a problem with any of the features in the public beta and you need to go back to 19 for any reason. However, when you do create a new project in 20, there's a new option which asks you for a media location for the project. This option mainly affects new media created by Resolve, such as when using the new voiceover recording tools. You can change this location at any point once you're in the project by going to the project settings and changing the project media location. Although it's been possible to record simple voiceovers in Resolve, up until now it's always been a little bit complicated and convoluted. You had to patch mic inputs to tracks, you could only do this in the Fairlight page. It was all a little bit of a faff and has needed simplifying for quite a while now. Thankfully, there's now a new voiceover tool in the edit page. You can find it by clicking this button, which brings up a simple window with a big record button. There are also options for enabling input monitoring, a three second countdown, as well as muting the timeline audio during the recording process. You can also choose to record in stereo, if you've got a stereo mic. The recording will be stored in the project's media location and added to the currently selected bin. All you have to do is give the recording a name, select the mic you want to use, and choose a track to add the recording to in your timeline. Leaving this set to auto will add a new track just for the recording. Then all you have to do is line up the playhead and press record. Leave behind everything you think you know about airplanes. As you can see, the recording is overwritten into the timeline and the recorded file is also added to the currently selected bin. Let me just solo the new voiceover track and listen back to the recording. Leave behind everything you think you know about airplanes. Now, of course, I've not done that line justice. Harrison Ford did it much better in the original. However, it just goes to show how easy it is now to record voiceover in the edit page. However, in the cut page, the voiceover tool is currently much more fully featured. Just click the voiceover tool under the viewer to open the options. In the recording settings, you can choose the input device, the track that you want to record to, the monitoring options, whether you want a three or a five second countdown, and you can manually choose the location of the recorded file on your system. And this is where the cut page has an additional surprise up its sleeve. It's got a built-in prompter. I'll just set in and out points in the timeline, which will define the speed of the prompter. Then I'll load a simple plain text script and enable the prompter overlay. Okay, I'll click the Q button to move the playhead back to the endpoint that I set, hit record, and off we go. Leave behind everything you know about airplanes and prepare to see them again for the first time. Again, I'll just mute the other tracks and have a listen. Leave behind everything you know about airplanes and prepare to see them again for the first time. There are a number of options that are mentioned in the new features PDF that I haven't found yet, including the ability to be able to control the speed of the prompter by using a speed editor. 
However, I'm sure that those features will be added in a later version of the beta, so I'll look forward to using them when they are. Another very welcome addition to the edit page is the ability to use the source tape that was initially introduced in the cut page a few years ago. Just like in the cut page, clicking the source tape button now switches to show the entire contents of the current bin in the viewer. This makes it super easy to scrub through large amounts of footage, the order of which is determined by the sorting in the media pool. Once you've found the shot that you want, you can either mark it directly in the source tape or quickly switch back to source clip mode by pressing shift Q. This makes it really easy to work through vast amounts of footage quickly and efficiently directly in the edit page. Now this is very handy, but one of the features that I'm most excited about is the ability to be able to use proper source timelines like we can do in both Avid and Premiere Pro. Firstly, any clip that's in the source viewer can now be opened in its own timeline by clicking the new timeline button. This is a read-only timeline, which you can easily tell because the playhead turns blue and you can't edit the clip or adjust its audio levels but you can also use it to add markers or in and out points, especially useful when viewing long source clips like this interview. That's why we say experience the Southwest. Pressing Q will quickly switch back and forth between the source timeline and the main timeline window, allowing you to complete the edit. This is great when you've got a long single clip but it really comes into its own when you can load entire timelines into the source viewer and is a technique which a lot of factual editors use, especially when they've got huge amounts of source footage to work with. Simply sort the media pool clips in the order that you need and throw all the rushes into a regular timeline. Then open it in the source viewer. The source timeline is automatically displayed, allowing you to move through the rushes quickly. And you can easily swap between the different timelines by clicking the different viewers, making it much easier to work with lots of footage rather than having to open each clip individually. Another new feature that makes my list is the ability to be able to import Photoshop files and retain all the layer information. Now I know it sounds like a basic thing that should have always been there, and indeed we could do that in Fusion, but it just limited graphics work in the edit page. Now, when you edit a layered PSD file into the timeline, you can then choose to split the PSD layers in place. Then you can choose to animate each layer separately for more creative freedom. Each layer will also retain the original PSD layer name too. Personally, I'll be placing the PSDs in a compound clip before splitting them. Otherwise you may end up with crazy numbers of tracks in your timeline, depending on the number of layers in the PSD file, of course. Now there are some caveats to this in that you need to prepare the Photoshop file for importing to resolve by rasterizing certain layers and certain layer effects. However, I think it's a function that's been long overdue. And when it comes to animation, fans of keyframes are also in for a treat too, as Resolve now has a dedicated keyframes panel in both the cut and edit pages. Using the parameters view, you can manipulate all the keyframes for a particular selected clip to finesse the animation timing. Again, Premiere Pro and After Effects users will feel right at home here. For a little more sanity, you can also choose to show only the parameters that have keyframes applied, which will automatically update as you add keyframes in the inspector. You can also display the keyframes in context using the new keyframe tray in the timeline. And when you're ready to refine the animation, switch to the curves view, where you can quickly add ease in and ease out handles to a keyframe, 
and manipulate the animation simply and intuitively. This is also where you'll find the retime curves for variable speed changes too. This added space makes it much more useful, keeping the timeline ordered and simple, just the way I like it. Everything that I've shown you in this episode is available in the free version of the DaVinci Resolve 20 public beta. However, there are many more features that are available in the studio version, including a whole range of AI tools, and I'll be showing you those in an upcoming episode. So don't forget to subscribe so that you'll be notified when that's available. But until then, thanks very much for watching.